Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today's tech showcase. Um, before I hand it on over to our speakers, I just want to go over a few things. First, we have that chat box. Make sure to drop your LinkedIn um, so we can all connect. Um, then, of course, we have the questions box. If you have any questions for our speakers, make sure to put them there and we will get to them at the end. And now I will hand it on over to Dan and Bobby with Bloomfire. Yeah, thank you, Bridget. Appreciate it. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening, wherever this uh, finds you. It's my pleasure, along with my colleague Bobby, to talk to you today a little bit about Bloomfire. And within that, we're going to talk about a few things. We're going to talk about uh, enabling knowledge management to be that megaphone for insights across your organization. And then also, because it's a technology uh, 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 pitch, we're going to talk to you a little bit about our platform. So hopefully you guys find it engaging and, and have some. we can have some great questions and answers at the end. So a little bit by way of intro, um, my name is Dan Straben. I am the Chief Marketing Officer here at Bloomfire. That is probably not that interesting to you all, but the, the interesting part of my career is I've spent over 20 years working in Fortune 50 companies around insights and, and strategic marketing. So I've, I've had the opportunity to leverage technology in my leadership roles at, at, these, at these firms to amplify insights and, and gain uh, um, you know, uh, impact for our insights through the organization. So um, it's my pleasure to be here. I can talk shop about insights all day. I love it. Um, and uh, just a, a, a real joy to be able to share a little bit with you today. Uh, my colleague Bobby has uh, a great career as well, working across technology and, and, uh, and sales. So he's, uh, he is our right-hand person here for all things tech, uh, including our um, security reviews for key customers. So he has an intimate understanding about our technology platform as well as the implementation and he's worked with some great customers over the years so i'll kick off the first part of this we'll talk a little shop and then i'll turn it over to uh to bobby to give you uh, a product demo and then we can do some q a so that's the plan for the next uh 28 minutes so as we think about kind of amplifying insights for an organization and getting that optimal impact, there's a lot of things that go into creating a strategy for your insights group, right? So there's just kind of items around, you know, are you monitoring and publishing market trends? Are you able to be receptive to getting more speed? That was always a challenge for me, uh, especially in retail settings where I was leading insights to get insights fast enough. Are we creating those opportunities for interaction so that people can make database decisions? Um, are we communicating succinctly? Are we collaborating with the teams that own some of these outcomes? And are we measuring what we do? Um, those are all items. You know, in addition to that, are we establishing for our research clear objectives every time? Are we tying what we're doing to the things that matter to the organization? Are we leveraging our analytical tools? Are we cultivating research that's going to put the customer first? Uh, and are we embracing kind of that continuous learning and staying on top of things? I know from my time at GE, I got into a real rut where I was using kind of the same methodologies over and over, and I probably would have better served at doing some learning. So as you all think about it, right, from an insights uh, expert perspective, those are all, th these 11 things are kind of a good check to go through to say, look, if I'm if I'm really trying to amplify insights, if I'm trying to get that impact across my company, am I doing these 11 things? Well, do I have a plan to do these 11 things? And what I'm here to tell you is uh, the good thing is, is that technology can be a help. It's not going to solve every issue, but I kind of the, the items here that I've highlighted are all places where technology can really be a force multiplier for you when you're ready to uh, when you're ready to turn those things on. And um, and so as we start to think about this, you know, as a company for Bloomfire, we recognize like there's a lot of options out there for software as a service, for technology providers and insights and knowledge management. Our, our true belief is that the technology needs to be enabler, not a replacement. And I think um, 
that's really the mantra we've taken from our product development standpoint. And so as we think about kind of our future product development, we're really looking at these six S type things as saying for, from an insights perspective, how do we help our teams who are using our software do this, right? So we need to be able to be a help for you to be able to scan a market, to look across the data set, identify and return that relevant, relevant information proactively. So how do we turn those things on for you to bring that back to the market? Search is fairly basic, right? It's fairly basic in the sense of when I need information, can I go out, can I look across my, my data set and bring that back and be able to extract what's relevant? Search has a lot of flavors though. And so the need to be uh, almost 100% accurate on every search is really, really important. We'll get into that more in a second. The ability to select, right? So as we're getting back results, whether it's through scan, through search, how do we help prioritize those things that are gonna be most impactful? Um, how do we synthesize, right? This feels like a huge lift, maybe pre-generative um, AI, but you know, we start to say, how do we put together the different pieces of disparate information and research in order to leverage um, those into something new, that creation of new insight or meta-analysis? We need to be able to socialize. So we need that, you know, whereas scan and search are really so, uh, about kind of bringing it in, socialize is about pushing it out. Are we able to use technology to help push out the right information at the right time to the right stakeholders in order to give them that opportunity to interact? And lastly, signify, are we measuring the relevant impact of what we're doing as an insights team on how it impacts stakeholders and their initiatives? And what I can tell you is, I think, these line up pretty well to some of those things that we're going to do that you need to do when it comes to amplifying your insights. So, you know, that monitoring and publishing trends really fits well with scan. And you can see the arrows there, right? But that's really where we see that interplay. And so from a product standpoint, that's what we're building towards as a blue fire uh, uh, company to be able to provide to our insights partners. So I, I've made it to slide six, almost without mentioning generative AI. Uh, that does seem to be the theme that sucks up all the oxygen in most rooms that we're in. And so, you know, there's a couple of themes I'll just tell you about, right? And this isn't uh, meant to be alarmist at all, but, you know, as we've been working in, in generative AI, um, you know, I would say over the last year and then specific over the last six months, what we're recognizing is, um, you know, there are some issues we can we can run into here, right? There is kind of an inaccuracy and hallucination that occurs. So, you know, we do have to be careful with that. There's some ethical dilemmas. I think, you know, many of you probably have seen today that the that the main kind of LLM houses have agreed with uh, the White House to say, hey, we're going to create some markers on the back end of the AI stuff that we create to make sure it can be identified as AI, whether that's video or or text, so that it doesn't feel, you know, so that we can determine between real and, and AI driven. Um, I was at a, a, an AI conference a couple of months ago that was very marketing focused, and that felt very much like, oh, AI is going to take over the world, and it's a great thing, and here's all the ways we can do it, and felt you know, a little bit um, uh, maybe presumptive, right? And then I got a chance to go to IEX, another Green Book event in May, and I felt like that conversation was a bit more, uh, not muted, but just more realistic, right? We, we need to be thinking about the application of this so that uh, from a privacy standpoint, from a job standpoint that we're focused in on, bringing to bear solutions that are actually going to help people as opposed to uh, just for kind of bells and whistles. We also know that there's a product pro proliferation. Um, I mean, I think this was even, I think I grabbed this image maybe even a month or so ago. We know that like generative AI is kind of invading everything. We also know that people are like, hey, I kind of don't want to have to go everywhere to do these things, right? I want to be able to bring this together. I need that single source of truth. And so again, that's a unifying principle for us as a company. So as I think about generative AI and knowledge management specifically, right? There's a lot of places it's going to plug into. I think it's going to really be uh, continue to impact the space it already has. There's some 
great applications out there that are starting to put it into place, um, you know, around summer station, around using chatbots and assistance. And, you know, I think one that's not been fully thought out yet, but can be really effective is as we think about gaps in knowledge and how do we use that to inform the creation of training for, for organizations. So, you know, I think we will see that evolve in the knowledge management software side of, of, of this. In addition, on the research side, I think it's a little earlier space. I, I think insights, it's going to lag a bit versus knowledge management and customer support type of initiatives. You know, customer support's really rushing to get it put into everything because it becomes an FTE play. If I have this, I don't need, you know, these FTE. I think insights is gonna be a bit more measured. And so as we look at things like segmentation and targeting and social media analysis, predictive analytics, which has been using different forms of if, if then and, and AI for, you know, decades, um, you know, I think we'll see a more respectful approach to maybe how it gets pulled into the insight side, which is a good thing for all of us insights practitioners as well, uh, because it means that, you know, we're still focused on accuracy and we're still focused on application of that. So from a Bloomfire side, right, this is where I kind of turn the hat a little bit and say, look, we've been working with AI for, for almost our whole existence as a company, you know, whether that's search, whether that's video, whether that's uh, our Q&A engine, auto summarization we've had, keyword auto tagging, um, and, and other elements. And now what we're doing is we're starting to layer on how generative AI is going to expand these capabilities. And what I'll tell you is, you know, we, we've created these pillars for us so that they can always be our kind of North Star. Um, you know, pillar one is really like, look, we're a, we're a company that exists to keep knowledge safe, right? Our job is to make sure that the, the, the proprietary information and knowledge that our, our, our customers and clients have is safe. And so as we develop this, um, you know, that it always is going to be job one, whether that's in terms of how it's structured within our, our servers, meaning no intermingling or how we train our AI models. There's not going to be a benefit to company X because it learns from company Y. We just can't have that be the case. And we know our customers don't want that. Um, we also need, we need, we know we need to be damn near perfect on our results. Um, that is, a, again, a requirement, I think, of being a good knowledge management company is we need to get very, very close to perfect on every result. And we've seen, you know, in our experimentation, we've definitely seen um, some ability to do that uh, based on what we've done in the past. And now we're evolving the, the LLMs to be able to do that as we kind of uh, push into the generative AI side. And then the last piece of it is, is it's always going to be deployed to augment the intelligence of workers at companies. So this is not a replacement for people. Let's be clear. This is about that exoskeleton super suit that exists so that we can uh, pr uh, help our, our, our customers be able to, uh, to action against that. So to that end, you know, we're going to be a company that grows organically. We've done that over our 10 year career. We're also going to be a company that grows inorganically. And one of the things that came out this week is we've acquired a company called Siva, who has a history in, in technology specifically tied to kind of the customer support space, but they have some great um, underpinnings of their technology. They're going to be really useful to knowledge management and insights engines, including conversational AI that will advance us uh, from kind of a, a bot, uh, a chat bot standpoint, federated search to go deeper into uh, other data stacks in and in, in information stacks in a company, real time tracking and analytics. So we can make those decisions and really get that kind of signify, right, to be able to say, hey, here's our ROI. You know, and then meet people in the tools that they're already in, Slack, Confluence, Salesforce, Teams. So we're looking forward to putting those uh, in, uh, in place as we, uh, you know, kind of continue to refine our, our product roadmap. And we welcome the team across. It's a fantastic team. Um, uh, see the CEO is our CTO now, and, and, and we've made good progress even in the last week. So what is that future vision, right? I think really for Bloomfire, it's being able to kind of be at that point of inflection with the uh, with the insights expert, with this company stakeholders, and be able to 
be somewhat technology agnostic to go reach into the organization to make sure that we can pull out that accurate resort in the right accurate result in the right time at the right place. And so when you think about those success capabilities we're trying to build, really ultimately, you know, it shouldn't matter what that technology is, whether it's generative AI, whether it's a, a search, whether it's federated search, whether it's a chatbot, whatever the case may be, as long as it's it's operating under those three rules, right? Um, it's not quite Asimov, but like the three rules being, is it safe and secure? Is it accurate? And are we doing it to benefit the, 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 the worker as opposed to just for the technology's sake? So we're excited about this vision and bringing it to bear um, in, you know, over the next uh, uh, three months or so. So lastly, bef before I kick it off, like we know, you know, we've talked a lot about AI and I'll tell you, there is a real AI threat. And that threat is that some of my uh, marketers have learned how to use Midjourney. And so for a re I thought we could, uh, before I kick it over to Bobby, we could have this little fun thing. So at one of our recent company meetings in front of everyone, that marketer decided to create um, uh, pro wrestler versions of Bobby and I. So it's, uh, I, 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 you know, I, I have no shame, so I'm happy to share it here. So you can see kind of pro wrestling Dan and Bobby here and what was created from AI, um, which we had now have to uh, wear as a badge of honor as we uh, go through additional company info. So this is what happens when you unleash AI without any restrictions, you get things like that. But with that, I will turn it over to my uh, tag team partner, uh, Bobby, to take us through a little bit of a product demo and then we'll get to questions. I appreciate it, Dan, and hopefully everyone's uh, retinas are not burned and we can still continue to follow along here as we put some product in front of you. But um, let me get my screen share up and we can dive right in here. And to Dan's point, you know, again, when we look at how we continue to invest in our technology, what I really want to talk about today is the way that we're benefiting two different uh, types of users and providing the best experience possible for them. And one is the person that's just trying to find research and insights that already exist in the organization, but also want to showcase what we're doing for those that are looking to use Bloomfire as that megaphone to influence outcomes in the business. Now, if we start with the person who's looking for that information that already exists, Bloomfire is leveraging AI in order to instantly deliver accurate results against a variety of different content types. And, you know, if I'm a marketer that's looking for key bits of information inside of a video that we created, uh, for example, maybe it's a focus group video or interview. Um, you know, I could have a project that's related to cryptocurrency, and I'm specifically looking for that video where we were talking about a concept called proof of work. What Bloomfire is allowing me to do is simply come in here and search for what it is that I need uh, and what I know. And when we run this search, our deep indexing is going to look across not only all the text-based assets, but also any of those video assets that we have, where we've created a transcript of that content that allows us to search against that spoken word. So the result here is that not only am I able to pull back this particular video and have the chance to review this, uh, when we start to play it, we're going to showcase where those breadcrumbs lie so that as that individual that was trying to access this information, I'm not only able to get to the correct asset, but also to that exact moment in time. And that becomes incredibly powerful, particularly in longer form video, where we spend a lot of our time uh, accessing the video, but then scanning through and trying to find a particular moment in time that we need. This is all just designed to, again, ensure that when we have to come back to this, all those little hidden nuggets that may be buried inside of content can sometimes or suddenly now become much more visible and much more accessible and really adds a lot of value back to the business. The other thing that you'll see for that user that's trying to come in and connect with this is that I have a lot of different ways to engage with the content directly in Bloomfire, and we think that that's a really critical piece as well. Uh, simple things like liking content, but also bookmarking so I can come back to revisit this again if I need to in the future sharing with colleagues, uh, you know, flagging if there's something that I see that's incorrect in this, I can alert my administrators and we can come back and, and make sure that we can review this. So ways to have the environment self-policed by end users, but just a number of mechanisms that are built in intentionally to try to give more options to that person that's coming to consume this content, as well as have those feedback loops that are built in for the administrators. Now, that was a very pointed search. I knew that content was in there and I wanted to just quickly get to it. But we also allow users to run broad searches and leverage our AI in order to pull back the really relevant information. So if we stay with the topic of the day, artificial intelligence, when I run a search for this, we're going to get a lot of content back. Over 500 matches have been found here because of that deep indexing. 
But the power of Bloomfire is coupling the deep indexing with a relevancy score where I, our AI is scoring every item in this environment in order to determine what is the most important or most relevant content that I should surface first, while still, again, empowering the end user to override that and say, actually, I want the most popular content on this topic or something that was published or updated more recently. So lots of control that's built in there for the user, giving them the ability to dictate what they want to see, um, but a power behind the scenes with our AI to automatically deliver these relevant results. As a user comes through and interacts with this, we're showing search references, which is a preview into the content. And the important thing to recognize here is that we're showing where we found matches and helping you to understand a little bit more about that. So in the title, in the description, in the document body, but it's also allowing us to expand beyond just capturing the full typed out form of artificial intelligence and also pick up on variations of AI because of our inclusion of a custom synonym dictionary. And as we talk with our customers, we recognize they have very unique needs. Uh, I have internal jargon, industry jargon, acronyms that are really critical to me. And when we wanna have a very positive search experience here, we, we truly wanna be able to account for all of those through a single search instead of a user having to come back and run subsequent searches for other variations or potentially miss out on some of the relevant information because of which of these options they chose. This is putting more confidence in the users that when I'm running a search, everything that is truly available to me is on screen and in front of me. And I don't have to fear that I'm missing out on something or again, have to go and scrape all these other corners in order to really see what we know about this topic. Now, as we look into this, the challenge is that this is a lot of information to consume. And you know, not only do I have my primary research in here, I also have content that's fed in from my external sources like Kantar. So a lot of information in here for someone to sort through. But when we wanna get more finite with this and maybe try to see, well, what do we know about artificial intelligence and how it impacts the consumer? I'm not necessarily having to create complex queries to address that. I instead have these fully customizable filters that live over here on the left rail that we can leverage. And we've intentionally mirrored kind of an online shopping experience where I'm now able to come in and stack and apply as many of these filters as I need to so that I can walk my way into that more specific content and not have to do so in a disjointed way or something that's really unfamiliar. And we see incredibly high levels of adoption amongst our users because of our mirroring of these interfaces that we're used to in our personal lives. A Google-like search experience, an Amazon-like filter application, you know, simple things that any user can come in here and say, okay, I know what I'm doing and therefore can be quite effective in running their searches. As we open this up, I'll simply contrast what we saw with the video post and that the bulk of what we were driven to here is a 70 page PDF that we're able to view directly in line. So again, no downloads or off-screen experiences for that person that just needs to consume this content. But it's also about being much more than just a dumping ground or a file storage solution. Bloomfire affords you the opportunity to also have this additional context around your content. And this can also be really powerful because not everyone who's gonna be accessing this is completely familiar with the topic, thus them coming on this knowledge journey. So our ability to highlight some of those key insights or have summarizations is really critical and allows that person who's publishing information to convey all the facts they need to. And for the person that's consuming information, they're not always met with something dense. They also have the ability to have some of the supplemental context above to really ensure they're oriented around what they see and what they've got in front of them. The final piece to this, and it's on all of our posts in Bloomfire, is again, when we have engagement and talk about that, we recognize that it can be important for individuals to interact with one another. And doing so in Bloomfire is much more functional than if we were to do that in Slack or Microsoft Teams or email chains. Because the problem with those solutions and having a dialogue there is that it's rarely captured and made accessible for others to see and learn from again in the future. So if we instead get that behavior to happen in Bloomfire, then now I can at mention colleagues and ask clarifying questions and see their response. I can understand successes and challenges that others have had as they've leveraged this information because they're sharing it here. So even if I'm new to the organization and, and coming to this for the first time, I have everything that I really would want to know right here in front of me. The documentation itself, the context above it, and then more of the utilization of it down below from my peers, all giving me much more confidence on how I apply this to my own work and ensuring that I'm not missing anything because I simply didn't look in an email chain or wasn't a part of a particular Slack channel. So all of this is just, again, trying to empower that end user who needs to find the information to be successful, uh, a number of paths they can go down. When we look at this from a content creation standpoint, we have a whole different series of challenges that people are bringing up with us. Uh, the pain grenade that we, we talk about is often that I spent a lot of time crafting a report that has all this great information inside of it. I want to 
hopefully be able to upload that to Bloomfire and have some action taken where I can get that summary. I can get that uh, category application. I can do all of these things without having to take a lot of time out of my day. So if we look at how that actually comes together when we're creating content, what we're trying to do is simply ensure that users have a number of different options in front of them where our AI is doing the heavy lifting, assisting that user, not replacing them to use Dan word, Dan's words, but really speeding up that process. So I may have been working on an item here that I've actually got uh, in Google Drive. So using my connection there, I can come over and grab this. Uh, I know that this is the new research report that I've been working on. So I'll go ahead and upload this file. Uh, this happened to be a Google Docs file. We'll immediately begin processing it where we're ensuring, number one, we can render it in our document viewer. But number two, we also complete the first step that our AI is doing, which is fully indexing that file. So I can say that this is the Thrift Sustainability report. And as this finishes processing, it's going to render. And again, there won't be any delay in me having to get this fully indexed. It's already been done. Now, if I wanted to get that summary that we can pull together, again, I can leverage AI to do that either in a two sentence description or a six sentence summary in the body. So we'll go with the latter for this. Uh, that's going to scan through this and use the AI to generate a new summarization of this particular content. Now, of course, I could break this up or add some formatting to it if I needed to, but the context in here is all driven uh, directly from this particular report. Categories, you know, a moment ago, we saw that I was leveraging those filters in order to narrow down my results and hone in on something more specific. What we're looking at here is a fixed set of categories that the owner of this community have put into the environment. But instead of me having to go in and individually choose those, we can let the AI say, okay, based on what I see here, these look like they're appropriate categories and can automatically have that appended to this particular uh, piece of content. The advantage is just that now those are going to be filter options that a user can uh, leverage as they're trying to navigate to find this information beyond just running a keyword search. Even tags can be generated by our AI. Tags are more of a traditional identifier that we see on content. While it's not the primary driver of my search experience, they still do add value. Uh, sometimes tags can be words that are not actually in this document and therefore can just be additional paths that someone could lean into as they're trying to search for this. Uh, but it's just yet another way that we can stack more metadata on top of this content to increase its findability without overburdening that end user or that uh, researcher as they're trying to just simply get this content live. We won't dive into every single corner of all the different options that you have in here, but at the end of the day, when we go ahead and publish this content, what we're going to do is send out a series of notifications so that there's awareness that new information is available. That information or those notifications can go through channels like email, but also connect to Microsoft Teams or Slack, places where we know we spend a lot of our day. And we try to just keep the rest of the organization informed and really lean on that megaphone that Dan was talking about so that my research doesn't just go into a dark corner where no one accesses it, but rather this is broadcast far and wide. Users are empowered to come in here and access this on their own, and they can see and engage with all the relevant material in front of them. So that's really the root of what I wanted to get at uh, today. And, you know, again, as Dan mentioned, a lot of exciting things that are going to be coming here in the near future. But I'll go ahead and pause here and see if there's any questions from the crowd or anything else that we can clear up. Yeah, so we had one uh, question, for, or two questions, actually, one from Michelle and one from Krista. Um, I answered it in the chat kind of briefly, but Essentially, Bobby was asking about secondary research sources and kind of the proprietary research search versus external. And so the answer I, I can give you there is twofold. One, we, we do have API connections with a variety of, of secondary research sources. So if those are set up and, and aligned, um, you, you're not going to have to enter that data into uh, into the knowledge base, right? So it's going to do that expanded search, and it'll return that result uh, as part of your search as well, which then you can tunnel through using uh, SSO um, um, to be able to go right to it on that company site. So it's a real neat way to kind of consolidate your, your whole research stack. Um, and, and get it in one place so people don't have to fumble for other passwords and, and the like. Um, so it still is certified. It's not kind of in the dark interwebs, but um, it, it goes that way. And then as we add additional federated search capabilities with the acquisition, you know, we'll be able to reach into the other applications across an enterprise to pull, you know, some level of insight from those. So hopefully that answers, uh, answers that question. Awesome. I Thank think you. we're up on time, right, Bridget? 
Yeah, we are right out of time. So thank you so much, Bobby and Dan. Um, this was a really great session. Um, and for all of our attendees, we will see you in the next one. Thank you. Thank you all.